There was a man from Great Britain. His name was A.K. Chesterton. He wrote a book about 25 years ago, and the title of the book was The New Unhappy Lords, An Exposure of Power Politics. Here's a statement that he made that should ring loud and clear to us who understand certain things of Bible prophecy. I quote, I claim with submission that what has been written in these pages proves the existence of a conspiracy for the destruction of the traditional Western world as the prelude to shepherding mankind into a sheep's pen run as a one-world tyranny. If the idea of so large of a conspiracy seems preposterous, it is not nearly so preposterous as the assumption that the post-war shaping of the world is innocent by design. End of quote. So here is a man who looked over the world after World War II and began to realize that there were alignments of nations that was not normal. Someone had to sit down in a giant boardroom in a smoke-filled room and sit down and lay, lay out and design and plot the succession of power after World War II. Mr. Chesterton's study also said that the conspirators demonstrated that theirs was an frenzied assault on patriotism. They wanted to eliminate patriotic values in every nation that they controlled. So it is in the United States of America today when we go to football and baseball games. At one time, we stood up, put our hand over our heart and sang the national anthem. And today, if you listen very carefully, you might hear a few people here and there singing. And most people are looking around with their hands down and they have no patriotism. They're embarrassed, as it were, to be known as a patriot of a country. He further revealed the plan of these individuals that he termed in his book as conspirators that all meaning, all remaining nations had to be softened up with a view to their absorption in federal bodies. He meant by that such as the European Economic Community in preparation for the ultimate one world Federation. So since World War II, what have we seen? We've seen the North American continent now become a free trade zone between Mexico, the United States, and Canada. Then we see the European Economic Community. Then we see the Organization of American States in Central and South America. We see the unified nations of the Soviet Union and her former satellite countries. All of them in union, in different blocks, federal blocks, as it were, preparing for a world government. All these things were 25 years ago. And yet, he came to the conclusion that there was someone behind the scenes it was a brotherhood of individuals who were striving to accomplish all of these things. There is another statement that needs to be made for the American people. On October 12th, 1992, will become the 500th anniversary of the discovery of the New World, America, and South and Central America, Canada. This year just could be the target date by which they want to institute the new world order if the present president has his way and is re-elected. This would put an end to all semblance of constitutional government as we have known it and the termination of our national sovereignty for all intents and purposes. I'm not saying that it will happen in 1992. I'm just saying this is what they're shooting for. They also shot for the year 1976, the 200th anniversary 
of the Constitution of the United States and so on, or our independence. It didn't happen. But these are very patient people. When they don't meet a target date, they set a new target, just like they did for Europe, January 1st, 1993, having everything in place for a unified Europe with a single currency. For many years, executive orders that are written by the President of the United States and put in the Federal Registry have been placed, and they now have established so many executive orders that literally, if a national emergency were to take place today, FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, could literally take over as a dictatorial power in the United States. They would suspend the Constitution, and the president would become a veritable dictator. A series of treaties between the United States and the United Nations organization has actually accelerated the erosion of our constitutional rights and national sovereignty. So that today, when patriotic citizens who think we're under the Constitution of the United States go into the court systems and they use the Constitution as their defense, they suddenly find the decisions are made against them. Because we came under the United Nations organization and where our Constitution conflicts with the United Nations, the United Nations is supreme. And so we walk away scratching our heads saying, there is no fairness anymore. No, we just haven't been told the true ramifications of what is happening on the world scene. The latest bill or treaty passed by the Senate and signed by President Bush is the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. It has some very chilling provisions within it. The Senate has added reservations to try to protect our constitutional rights. But this version that differs from that that is submitted by the United Nations, if it's submitted before the court, the court will make the decisions whether these reservations that protect our constitutional rights are legitimate or not. This law will go into effect at the end of 1992. President George Bush has signed into law the Emergency Banking Regulation Number 1. This is ready to go into effect during a monetary or a banking emergency. Notice what it does. It permits the closure of all banks, the seizure of the assets in all bank accounts, and the content of every safety deposit box becomes the federal government's. It prohibits the hoarding of food and fuel and permits searches of homes with no warrants to find if you have hoarded food and water and fuel. It also allows the seizure of food and fuel that is deemed to be hoarded, as well as all cash, precious metals, and securities. So the question becomes, how close are we to world government? How close are we to entering into it if they're laying the foundation for the complete takeover of everything that we have? And then another question I want to ask, and then I want to answer them during this sermon today is that does the Bible actually predict a conspiracy to develop a world government? This means in secret. And then all of a sudden, it's foisted upon us and everybody scratches their head and says, how did it happen? With the constitutional government of the United States and our national sovereignty hanging by a thread... The following quote from one of the world's leading globalists will give us a hint at what's planned for us. I quote, and after the quote, I'll give you who made the statement and where he made the statement. Quote, 
Today, Americans would be outraged if United Nations troops entered Los Angeles to restore order. Tomorrow, they will be grateful. This is especially true if they were told there was an outside threat from beyond. Where is beyond? Is it outer space? Whether real or promulgated, so he's saying whether it is real, a real threat, or whether we have to make up a threat and expose it on our media and make people think that it's real. Now I'll go back and read the entire statement with no comments. This is especially true if they were told there was an outside threat from beyond, whether real or promulgated, that threatened our very existence. It is then that all peoples of the world will plead with world leaders to deliver them from this evil. The one thing every man fears is the unknown. When presented with a scenario, individual rights will be willingly relinquished for the guarantee of their well-being granted to them by their world government. End of quote. Henry Kissinger, when he was addressing the Bilderberger meeting in Evian, France, May 21st, 1992. This was a, a transcribed tape recording by one of the Swiss delegates who transcribed it and made it available to people who wanted to know what is going on in the world today. What did he mean now that we would be threatened, our very existence threatened by something beyond? He literally meant UFOs. They actually have in a hangar that has been there for years and years a UFO. There have been people who have stated right on television that they were the ones who went there and they were sworn to secrecy. And now they no longer are remaining silent. Whether these UFOs are demons or whether they're just manufactured by the United States in secret, we'll find out eventually. There was a book written by an Australian who claims that the United States working with the Australian government has an underground facility and they hypnotize you before you can go into that facility where they're building UFOs. And then when you come back out, then they take you out from under this hypnotic spell and you don't remember anything. And he said that he went down in there pretending that he was hypnotized, but he wasn't. And he wrote a book about it, which I've quoted from before. Now, there's a book that is out. It's called The Brotherhood of Angels and of Men. This is written by a new ager by the name of Jeffrey Hodson. This particular book literally goes into detail how human beings can come into contact with the angelic realm, and these angels are very dangerous to human beings unless we fit into the category under which they want to talk to us. And it said they're standing there everywhere waiting for someone to open their mind to the spiritual beyond and allow them to come into their lives. And what is it that all the New Agers talk about constantly? They're led by their spirit guides that Christians know are demons. They have learned how to come into contact with the angelic world that is in rebellion to God Almighty. And so these spirit guides literally transmit to them the plan for world government by Satan the devil. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't want to offend him. He's better known as Lucifer. In this book, I'll only quote one part of it. The foreword to the book was written by a woman by the name of Annie Besant. She was a New Ager and a part of the Theosophical Society that was founded by H.P. Blavatsky. Blavatsky was a communist. She also had books dictated to her verbatim by demons. Then her successor, Annie Besant, had the same happen to her. 
Then following her was a woman by the name of Alice Bailey. Alice Bailey wrote books all the way up until 1957, the internalization of the hierarchy. And she had these books dictated to her and automatic writing. Demons typed them for them, for her. And then she published them. And it was called The Plan, how they were going to take over the world, how they were going to have a sophisticated type of bartering as a world economic system. What does it say in the book of Revelation, chapter 13, 16, and 17? That there will come a system, a mark of the beast, and no man can buy and sell without it. No cash, no currency, no coins. Only instant transfer of funds, which is bartering. In this book on the preface to the fifth reprint, notice what Jeffrey Hodson said. I'm quoting him. In 1924, as I was en endeavoring to observe and record descriptions of the nature spirit life, I almost suddenly found my consciences translated to the level at which I beheld the great member of the angelic host who named himself to me Bethelda. While I was fully conscious and able to dictate, he transmitted to me the ideas which have gradually been published in five successive books. End of quote. This was one of those books. The other books were The Angelic Host, Be You Perfect, Man the Triune God, and then The Supreme Splendor. In the back of this book, he gives a caution saying that anyone who learns how to deal and come into contact with the angelic force must do it in the proper way, or they can crush you. He tells how you have to have certain designs, and then you have to conjure up these demons, and the circle on these pentagrams and so on cannot be broken, because if there's a little broken place in it, like if you paint a circle, and there's a little spot that's not painted. A demon can come out and crush you. And this is confirmed by other people who have come out and written books. They were once in Satanism. So yes, there is something very powerful going on in the world today. And it is the supernatural. Remember the statements now that I have already made and read about executive orders. And I've given them before. 10,995 through 11,000 and something, and then they were all accumulated into one executive order, 11,490. All of them combined, and if they were to invoke that one executive order, all would be in place. An absolute dictatorship over everything in the United States of America. Then remember, I mentioned the comment by Henry Kissinger about United Nations troops going to Los Angeles. And that tomorrow, if it ever happened again, we may be thankful, but today we would be outraged. Does anyone remember the movie on ABC television, February 15th to the 22nd of 1987? It was entitled America with a K. It was based upon a book that you could buy at the bookstores. And the opening scenes, the United States was occupied by United Nations troops. They were preparing the minds for the American people to accept this. Are they doing it once again? Has there been something that's happened in the last four to five weeks from the taping of this message that is now preparing the minds of the people to realize that you cannot stand up against them no matter what and that United Nations troops are actually inside the borders of the United States of America at this moment. There was a man who was in the Green Beret. His last name was Weaver. For years, he had lived in a northern Idaho area, a wilderness area, on top of a little hill. They had no electricity, no running water, they carried their water. 
They had everything that was very rural, but that's what they wanted. They wanted to be a separatist away from everybody else because they knew what was going on today and they wanted to live at peace outside the realm of this new world order that's being prepared for us. So here he's in this little, little area by himself. He's known by all the neighbors in the county. Boundary County, Idaho. The FBI came to him, asked him to infiltrate the white supremacist group, the Aryan Nations in Idaho. He said he would do it. They gave him money. He went to two of their meetings and was repulsed by what he saw. He wouldn't go again. He told the FBI, I want nothing to do with it. Two weeks later, a man walks into the sheriff's office of the county he lived in and said, Mr. Weaver sold me this sawed-off shotgun. It was a quarter of an inch sawed off. They put out a warrant for his arrest. So, everything was fine. He answered it. Then they set a trial date. Because they turned him loose. He had lived there. Everybody knew him. He was a personal friend of the sheriff. So when it came time for his trial date in February of 1991, he didn't show. Nothing was said for 18 months. Between that time and the time of the incident, I'm going to report, he had already run for sheriff against his friend. Everybody knew him. There was no warrant put out for his arrest because he didn't show up for his trial. Everybody knew where he was. All it had to do was send a letter and say, we're going to come up and talk to you. You didn't show up for court. However, that didn't happen. His son went out in the yard, who happened to be 13 years old, because he heard his two hunting dogs barking. Then he heard shots, and his dogs fell over dead in the road. So he saw a movement, a man who had on an outfit that would camouflage him. So he shot back. And shots began to ring out and shot him in the arm. And he turned to run for his house and he was gunned down in his back. Over 500 federal agents, police, sheriff deputies, Idaho State Police, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms, U.S. Marshals, Border Patrol, and Immigration and Naturalization Service and members of the Idaho National Guard were hiding around their home in secret. Gunned down a 13-year-old boy. The family, three daughters, the husband and wife, go out and pick up the son's body. No shots are fired. They bring it inside. Then they go out again, and guns begin to fire. The husband is hit in the arm. So he says, run for the back door. As the wife tries to open the back door, a gunshot blows half her head off. From behind! They didn't do a thing. They weren't even armed. They had two helicopters, tanks, and then the curious thing, according to this newspaper article that I'm quoting from, was that if they had not given themselves up, they already had enough incinerary bombs that they are already used on a man down in Arkansas once before. They were going to go over with the helicopters and drop it and burn the building to the ground with the occupants inside. Now here is one man, a wife who's now dead, and three children inside and over 500 troops. So they get in touch with Bo Greitz who is running as a third-party candidate for the United States, who was the most decorated Green Beret in the history of the United States. And they served together, so he came up to talk to Mr. Weaver. By the time he got there, the government forces wouldn't let him. So finally, he talked him into at least talking through the door. But what is interesting was this. 25 miles away in Eureka, Montana, a mountainous, very rural area, were Belgium paratroopers. 
inside the border of the United States under mutual agreement with the United Nations. They were testing, learning United States procedures. And if they had not surrendered within 48 hours, the Belgium United Nations paratroopers would have come on the scene. The governor of the state of Idaho was prepared to declare a state emergency for two counties. If that had happened, then the United Nations troops could have come in. Now this is 1992. All this is leading into something. I want to give a quote now from the Arkansas Democrat newspaper. This was Thursday, February the 9th of 1989. Remember who is the governor of the state of Arkansas at this time. Here's what this Senate of Arkansas introduced under the guidance of this governor of Arkansas. Senate Joint Resolution Number 7 for a proposed constitutional amendment to provide for the establishment of a system of municipal courts in the state that abolishes existing police forces, the job of mayor of towns, and the justice of the peace and courts of common pleas. Who was the governor at this time? I believe his name is Bill Clinton running for the presidency of the United States of America. Now, I've introduced you to several things that are happening in the United States all at once. Bill Clinton could well become the next president of the United States. It's a possibility. If George Bush falters. Of course, we know George Bush is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations Trilateral Commission. He was on the board of directors of those organizations. He is a member of the ultra-secret fraternity number 322 of Yale University called Skull and Bones. All of these organizations are actively working for the overthrow of the United States and merge us into a world government. So now Bill Clinton comes on the scene. How did he come on the scene? How did he rise to such prominence? How did the unknown governor of a small, mostly rural state suddenly vault into the top showmanship and the limelight all across the United States of America in spite of absolutely proven allegations of adultery, military draft dodging, and other immoral behavior. How did he do it? Is someone or some group behind him that's pulling the strings? It's only fair to ask because before I'm through, I want to show and prove that the Bible predict predicted a conspiracy for world government that would climax man's rule on planet earth before the God of heaven sets up the true kingdom. The evidence is conclusive that all these things are true. There is someone behind Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton is owned lock, stock, and barrel by the great white brotherhood. The Rosicrucians, which then the branches of Freemasonry and the Illuminati, and all the other secret organizations work together in concert. This is the power elite of the world that is backing him if George Bush falters. They first recruited Bill Clinton and educated him at Georgetown University. This is awfully important to understand. Adam Weishaupt, who founded the Illuminati May 1st, 1776, was a former Jesuit at a Jesuit university, Ingolstadt University in Germany, Bavaria, Germany. Now Bill Clinton is trained at Georgetown University, a Catholic Jesuit university. He was trained by an insider, Professor Carol J. Quigley. Next, after his graduation, Bill Clinton 
was sent off to Oxford University in England on a Rhodes Scholarship. He was introduced to the finer points of the plan for world government. You see, the Rhodes Scholarship was made by leaving a fortune by Cecil Rhodes of England when he tapped the diamond mines and so on and other minerals in South Africa. And he left his vast fortune so that those who would bring about and help to bring about a world government, they could be trained for it at Oxford University. So Bill Clinton spent his years there preparing for world government leadership while the other American boys were dying in Vietnam. After that, his elitist superiors that paid for this shuffled this promising new servant off to Yale University, where George Bush's skull and bones was located. With a law degree in his hand, Bill Clinton returned to Arkansas. Note now, this is very interesting. Arkansas is a state that has been totally controlled for decades by the Rockefeller banking tycoon. I have stood on Pettit Jean Mountain on the property of the Rockefellers and seen their vast farms. I know the state is controlled by the Rockefellers. Soon this great white brotherhood, the Illuminati, would begin to reward their faithful servant with a political post as governor of the state of Arkansas, priming him until he could become the president of the United States if their hand-selected man, George Bush, faltered. The press back in Little Rock, Arkansas, has tagged Mr. Bill Clinton, Slick Willie, because of his talent in the political trickery, shrewdness, and deception. Now, these are the words of the Arkansas Democrat. Another nickname for the man who could become president of the United States, and we could call him this, we could call him Bilderberger Bill. You see, it was the Bilderbergers in 1991 at their secret meeting at Baden-Baden, Germany, that put their final stamp of approval upon Clinton's try for the Oval Office. In his acceptance speech in New York at the Democratic Party's National Convention, Bill Clinton acknowledged his debt to the one man who was chiefly responsible for his initiation into the ranks of this secret elite, Professor Carol J. Quigley. When Bill Clinton stated the following words that night at Madison Square Garden, Every single syllable was addressed to the hidden men in the background who rule over the world. Here's what he said, quote, As the scripture says, and if you'll remember, a lot of Christians got upset because he took it out of context, totally misquoted it. Here's what he said, As the scripture says, Our eyes have not yet seen, nor our ears heard, nor our minds imagine what we can build. We can do it. As a teenager, I heard John Kennedy's summons to citizenship. And then as a student at Georgetown, I heard that call clarified by a professor named Carol J. Quigley. End of quote. What did all this mean? It didn't mean much to us, but to those people in the Illuminati, he sent out the proper signals. This is called es esoteric secrets. It's secret language with hidden meanings to those in the know. And he was sending the right signal. First of all, he twisted scripture. Clinton affirmed the goal of the secret brotherhood to build the New World Order. Because he twisted the scripture, he said, we can build it. I want to read you now what the scripture that he twisted says. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9. 
Eye has not seen, nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Bill Clinton said, we are preparing it. In the Bible, it says God prepares it. Secondly, Bill Clinton briefly mentioned John Kennedy's summons to citizenship. Then he quickly stated that George, uh, Georgetown University professor George, or Carol Quigley is the one who clarified the meaning of that phrase to him. Now, what's the crucial difference between what President John F. Kennedy stated and Professor Carol Quigley's clarification? John Kennedy gave his patriotic speech and it was addressed to the American citizens, not to the citizens of the world. He said, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. This is Americans, our country. But the late Carol Quigley, who wrote an over a thousand page book clarifying this world government coming, he detested and de reviled anything that had to do with country and nationalism. Quigley actively conspired for world government. And it was actually, he was the one who brought Bill Clinton in on the plan. He clarified the meaning of Kennedy's words and expanded it to Bill Clinton. Here's actually what Bill Clinton was meaning. Ask not what your planet and its masters can do for you, but what you can do for your planet and its masters. That's basically what he was saying. Professor Carol Quigley admitted his involvement in the world conspiracy in his 1,300-page book, Tragedy and Hope, and you can buy it at a bookstore. You can check it out at a library. Quigley wrote to his fellow conspirators, I quote, their aim is nothing less than to create a world system of financial control in private hands, able to dominate the political system of each country and the economy of the world as a whole, end of quote. Bill Clinton's phrase of his mentor and teacher, Carol Quigley, is further proof that he is a puppet in the hands of the Bilderbergers. If president of the United States, he will be the one, if he defeats George Bush, to actually usher the United States into the new world order. But then wait a minute. Doesn't he have a vice president who might be able to offset his drive for world government? Let's look at the background very quickly of Senator Al Gore. I will name him as America's top New Age evangelist. Now let's look at a little of his background and see what he says. June of 1992 in Milwaukee at the annual convention of the Presbyterian Church, USA, the pastors and other delegates participated in a Native American Indian ritual. It's called paganism to us. The ritual ceremony involved walking through smoking sage and was intended to expel unwanted spirits. And it was to attract the favorable spirits to the meeting. This is paganism. It was demonic. You and I know it. It was a pagan ritual, which United States Senator Al Gore, who says he's a Southern Baptist, would have been proud to be there. In his best-selling book that you can go to the store and buy it, probably B. Dalton Bookstore would carry it, or Walden Books, which is owned by Kmart, incidentally, which is the number one purveyor of pornography in the United States in its, in its bookstores that it owns. His book was called Earth in the Balance, Ecology and the Human Spirit. Gore denounces fundamentalist Christians on page 263. 
while he applauds Hinduism, Buddhism, and other Eastern religions. Al Gore endorses the Mother Goddess Revival. Also, Native American shamanism. Shamanism is the conjuring up of spirits to come and be a guide to you. He also, on page 258 to 263, went along with earth spirit worship. In his book, Mr. Al Gore glowingly writes of, and I quote, vast earth, the mother of all. Fondling all creation in her lap, on page 261. Then he also recites an Indian prayer addressed to O Great Spirit and insists that Native American religions, and these are his words right out of his book, offer a rich tapestry of ideas. End of quote. Now, as for his own religious ideas, it's plain, I believe, from this book that Senator Gore is new age to the hilt. All of us who understand what Christianity is know that Jesus Christ crucified and his ascension to the Father, and now he gives us his Holy Spirit. And that's what impregnates our mind and prepares us for a new body so that we can be a son of the living God and live forever. However, Al Gore in his book says that he believes that we have God within us. That's the New Age philosophy right down the line. Has anybody ever heard the word pantheism? Pan means everything. You look at the universe, you look at the sun, the moon, you look at planets, asteroids, you look at comets, you look at the rocks, the trees, the bricks, the dirt. Everything that exists is God. There is no personal God. There was no person, Jesus, who was God. Everything's God. Since you are a part of the existence of the earth, then you are God. This is what Al Gore believes. This is what all religions believe that are a part of this New Age movement. Listen to what he says. He criticizes those Christians who believe, and I quote page 264, that it is heretical to suppose that God is in us. End of quote. Now, it is heretical when you don't believe in a personal God. And when you believe you are God, just like a rock is God, just like a dog is God, and flowers and a microphone is God. You see? There is no personal God. Everything makes up what God is. Therefore, since we are a part of the cosmos, the universe, then we are gods also. That's paganism. That's a part of the secrets of the secret societies. They worship things. And it says in Revelation chapter 1, when they could have known who God was, this is Romans chapter 1, they could have known who God was, but they worship the things of this earth. For Gore, God is not a personal God who is in heaven, who has a throne to rule upon, and Jesus Christ sits at his right hand. Instead, everything is God. He believes the creation is God. And that's exactly what Romans 1 says that people would revert to in the last days. Worship of the creation instead of the creator. On page 265, he says, Nature in its fullest is God. Hmm, interesting. Now, this is the man who is running for vice president of the United States. So that means we have two, or we have a vice president on the Republicans and a president on the Democrats who were both invited to Bilderberger meetings in 1991 and 1992, and they were both approved. Then we have the president now, who is a Republican, once again running for the presidency. 
He was a Bilderberger, Council on Foreign Relations, trilateral member. And then we have the vice president who was a new ager. So no matter who wins, we're the losers. There's a book that's been put out called The Gaia Atlas of Future Worlds. What does Gaia mean? Mother Earth. Teaches you how the world is going to have to return back to nature and that there is no personal God in slick, beautiful pictures. And this is what Al Gore believes. Where are you and I going to stand? With all this documentation now for a desire for world government, what's literally happening right here in the United States of America, can it be possible that the Bible literally prophesied a world government? and that it's a conspiracy for world government. Let's look at a few scriptures now, right in the Bible, and see if there is a global government that's prophesied. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 13. Let's see if this prophecy says that it will involve all peoples, all languages, all ethnic groups, every nation on earth. In Revelation chapter 13, verse 1, I, I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea. In chapter 17, verse 15, he shows the waters of the sea are peoples, nations, tongues. So all this is saying is a government's going to rise up out of the masses of humanity. Then in verse 2, in the latter part, it tells us where it receives its power. It says, and the dragon gave him his power, his seat, and great authority. The dragon, according to Revelation 12, verse 9, is Satan the devil. That old serpent who was in the Garden of Eden who deceived. And ever since then, mankind has been under the control, except those few that God calls out of this system. Satan's government. Verse 3. The latter part, it says, and all the world wondered after the beast. If all the world is going to wonder after and go after and follow after this beast, that means there has to be deception. There has to be an astonishment of some type, some type of underground current that brings up a world government and all of a sudden people say, there it is. Man is saved. How did it happen? And they're going to want to know, and they're going to follow it, and they're going to be mesmerized by it. Then in verse 4, it says there will be a worship system. They will worship the dragon, that Satan the devil, who's known as Lucifer, who gives power to the rise of the system. They won't know it, Satan. They won't call it that. They will call it the angel of light that's evolving man toward godhood. That makes it sound flowery and nice and sweet, doesn't it? And when they bring down miracles in the front of all people, then naturally they're going to have the power and people are going to look at it and say, wow, this has got to be the truth. This is going to solve all our problems for the world. That in verse 4 describes a military apparatus, this beast power, and they're going to say, who can make war with him? Who can stand up against him? Why? Because we've been in the process of disarming the nations, giving all the military equipment to the United Nations, and we'll work under the auspices of that organization. Then verse 6, though, this person who heads it all up will speak blasphemy against God because he claims to be God himself. Verse 7, It was given unto him to make war with the saints. And what did it say on that February 15th to the 22nd, 1987 ABC television miniseries, America? The son of the president, who was standing up addressing the student body of the school he attended, had a red handkerchief around his neck. All the students had to wear a red handkerchief, just like they do in the Soviet Union and China. And he said, anyone who will not enter into the new age will be crushed. And he said it twice. And right here, the Bible says it was given to him, this beast power, 
who Satan is in control of to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all nations, kindreds, and tongues. All. No one will escape it. It is global conspiracy. And only those who are under the divine protection of God Almighty and the shed blood of Jesus Christ and are in harmony with his everlasting covenant, according to Revelation chapter 3, the Philadelphian church, only those are going to be spared from the great tribulation. All other nominal Christians who haven't got their lives right and refuse to submit to all the Bible, they will go through the tribulation. Now let's go back to Daniel chapter 7. This is global in prospect. In Daniel chapter 7, the entire book of Daniel talks about beasts, which are governments. In chapter 7, verse 23 to 27, Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth. That was Rome, the Roman Empire which shall be different from all kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth. So it's going to be a powerful system and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are kings that shall arise. And another shall rise after them. And according to history, this happened. When the breakup of the Roman Empire, Europe was left in ten sections. Ten nations that are identified on the map today. And then in 476 or 438 was the starting of it. And But then in 476 is when the wars began. The Pope of Rome defeated three of those areas and consolidated into Italy. And so today we see in the European scene seven identifiable nations that has not changed its borders till this moment. But also we're identified in Daniel 2 verse 40, 40 through 44, that there will be 10 nations or 10 grouping of nations that will compose world government at the very end of the age and all 10 of them will be intact and they'll fight Jesus Christ. Now let's continue right here in Daniel 7 though. Verse 25, he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws. This happened with the ascendancy of the papacy. He thought to change him, and he enforced, enforced the changing of the Sabbath to Sunday, all of God's holy days to pagan holidays, the worship of the sun god at Saturnalia and Bromelia called Christmas today, the worship of the queen of heaven, which God prophesied against in the book of Ezekiel, and we call it Easter today, and they pronounced it identically to that in the Babylonian language. And they shall be given into his hands until a time, times, and dividing of times. The last three and a half years, when the beast will rule in its fullness. But the judgment shall sit. They shall take away his dominion to consume, to destroy it unto the end. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. So this identifies how long this system, this fourth Roman Empire, will last. There were certain revivals all during the Middle Ages. And then today at the end of the age, there's going to be a global government and it will fight Jesus Christ and his saints. But it will have the prevailing hand until the saints are resurrected to receive their glorified body so they cannot be assassinated. Now, there is going to be a religion attached to this government. The conspirators worship strange gods of forces. Do you realize in all the occult religions, Freemasonry, the Rosicrucians, Skull and Bones, all these secret societies, when you get up to the very top degrees and you finally learn the final secrets, they worship elements like water, fire, wind. They worship nature, just like Al Gore said in his book. It's called pantheism. And that's exactly what's going to rule. That's why a human being can go into the temple, claim to be God, and he's a human that could die and be assassinated because everything is God. He has just ascended to a higher state of consciousness 
according to all the New Age literature. Well, let's look at that in Revelation. Or since we're here, no, let's go to Revelation first. Revelation chapter 17. Chapter 17, verse 1 and 2. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come here, and I'll show unto you the judgment of the great whore that sits upon many waters. A whore is a church. It's a religious system. Because we're going to see, in the same context, this religious system rides the beast, the political. They're going to go hand and glove together to create world government. And this is not just the Roman Catholic Church. Do we realize the Roman Catholic Church is a Johnny-come-lately, basically? All the secret societies were before the church and before Jesus were ever born. They had all the identical doctrines in secret by the hierarchy of those secret societies. Then when the Christian church was bringing people out of this paganism, they decided to infiltrate and take over Christianity. So the visible outward Christianity we see in the world today is nothing but paganized Christianity that have been taken over. That's why the uh, St. Franciscan monks have the identical garb right down to the very belt around their waist that the ancient great white brotherhood wore in Egypt. That's why the secret society of the Jesuits, it's secret. You don't know what they teach. You don't know what they believe. Verse 2, with whom the kings of the earth. Now here's the political the great whore was the religious. So this religious system committed fornication, illicit relationships with kings. They wouldn't wait for the true and the living God to establish his kingdom. And so they wanted to set up their own religious system with the kings of the earth. And the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with a wine, the intoxicating false doctrines that sound so good. And now let's drop down to verse 5 and 6. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. So this is a secret society that is responsible for all the false teachings and doctrines. All of them. And they infiltrate churches. Why do you think churches have steeples on them? That's not Christian. That's Rosicrucian. That's Freemasonic. Because in ancient pagan religions, these secret societies worship sex. They worship the erected male penis, and it was a steeple. And then it always had a, a circle or a square around the bottom, and that was the female vagina. And so they worship procreation. So you look at churches, Christian churches, all over the landscape, and what do they have? Masonic symbols all over them. They've been infiltrated in secret. And they worship things that they're not even told. The average person goes there and thinks they're following the Bible. But then those in the hierarchy know the secrets. And they're worshiping another God. Verse 6. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Here are the true saints that would not participate in their vile practices. And they are being killed for the name of Jesus. So it is a religious system to go with it. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it once again shows the final fulfillment when someone will come to such great power that's a part of these secret brotherhoods that they will literally enter, enter into a temple that was dedicated to the great one and only God of the universe. And then he will claim to be that God. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, by our gathering unto you, that you be not soon shaken in mind. Why? Because demons work on the mind to destroy us, to upset us, to cause us to fall away. Or be troubled neither by spirit, once again, wicked spirits, nor by word, that's slander, nor by letter as from us, that's forgery, to teach you something else that I'm not teaching. As that the day of Christ is at hand, here is the time setting. The day of Christ, right when he's about to return. Let no man deceive you by any means. 
for that day shall not come. Christ won't return except there come a falling away first and you cannot fall away unless you got the truth to start with. When you fall away, you're not having the truth. It's lies. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So since these secret societies worship Satan or Lucifer, he is the father of lies, according to Matthew 8, 44. Or John 8, 44, I'm sorry. So it's this system that's going to infiltrate, pretend to be Christian, so that the billion people who are Catholics, so that the Baptists, the Methodists, the Presbyterian, the Christian churches, all the rest, will accept this person as God. What would be greater to deceive mankind than suddenly a bright light come from the east? Didn't Christ say it would come from the east to the west? He would gather his elect? What if a great light came into the atmosphere of the earth and it was something unknown? And all of a sudden, these people that say they're going to be raptured before anything happens, what if they're not raptured? What if it's Lucifer coming into the atmosphere of this earth and he establishes himself through a human being in the temple in Jerusalem and claims to be God and he has supernatural power and he fulfills Bible prophecy? Deception? You know, you will know whether it's the true or the false because before Jesus establishes himself on this earth, we will be changed to our new glorified body and caught up to what looks like the sea of glass and will be given our reward at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Then we will descend to destroy this false system. So when someone sets himself up and claims to be God and you haven't been changed and you know you have the Holy Spirit of God, you know that it's a false system. And when you resist it, they won't like you. You will be a cancer in the brain cells of humanity according to their language. And they must cut it out. And according to their language, they're going to send us to another plane. Well, verse 4 says, Who, this individual, opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. You better be prepared for it. I've preached it to the old proverbial statement till I'm blue in a face. And yet, we now are closer than we have ever been before. All those sermons I gave back in 1983 about United Nations occupation, United Nations coming into this country, all those old tapes, every bit of it is happening, just like I said, right now. And if you don't believe it, go back and read them or listen to them. Every bit of it is happening. Well, there is going to be a small ruling elite a small group who will control the whole world. At first, there will be 10 leaders, and then they will give their all their military, economic power and spiritual power to one person over all of it. Revelation chapter 17. Revelation 17. I'll read verse 12 and 13. So the Bible does prophesy there is a great conspiracy for world government, and it's Satan behind it, and he uses human beings. Those human beings aren't even responsible for what they're doing. They are deceived. Verse 12 and 13. And the ten horns which you saw are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with a beast. These have one mind, they have the same goal, the same purpose as all secret society, a novus ordo seclorum, a new world order, and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. So one person will sit in the temple and claim to be God, and the other ten will back him with all their natural resources, military resources, economic resources, spiritual resources, and everyone on earth will be required to worship him. Revelation 13, verse 8. 
and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. Notice all. Yes, your relatives, your friends, some of your mothers, fathers. They're going to worship this person thinking that it's the true God and finally the kingdom of God is on earth and there will be peace and prosperity and happiness from now on. It's the new golden age of Aquarius. It says everybody on earth will worship him except, you see, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Their names weren't written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. No, Jesus was as good as slain from the foundation. God didn't know who was going to be at this end of the age until he called you. Many are called, but few are chosen because only the few can resist the persecution, the pressure of society, their friends, their relatives, and who dare to stand for the God of the universe against the rising tide of the new world system under Satan. That's why few will enter into that kingdom and the few will return with Jesus Christ to destroy this Satan-worshipping system and set up the true kingdom of God. And we, our destiny is to become kings and priests. You see, everything that God has prophesied to be true, Satan is counterfeiting. In the Bible, we're called the elect. Satanists are the elect. You see? We are to become kings and priests. They are the ones who are the most powerful and educated and the elite to rule the world. They're the ones to bring the secrets to mankind. The priest of the new age. It's a sick system and Jesus Christ will destroy it. They're going to have an international economic system. It's going to be an order which nobody will be able to resist. Nobody. Look in Revelation chapter 13, verse 16 and 17. And he, this religious person, caused all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And the universal product code system that is coming today, and all the markings on the boxes and the packages and the motors and the engines and the airplane parts, that's only leading up to the day when they're going to put a mark on our right hand or forehead so that we can transact business. And it says, No man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. There will be an economic system which you and I will be totally excluded from if we don't take a mark and we will pledge allegiance to this God-man that is not a God at all, but inspired by Satan the devil that sits in Jerusalem. If we swear allegiance to them, and him and his government then will be given the privilege of buying and selling through a mark on the right hand or forehead. And they now have projected putting these lines on the right hand or forehead, but it's invisible to the human eye. Only scanners can pick it up. They're ready. Everything that the Bible prophesies is intact. They're waiting for their emergency. That's all. Well, I'll just mention a couple of other things and bring it to a close. Those in charge will control all the money markets of the world. All precious metals, gold, silver. In Daniel 11, verse 37 and 38, it states that this end time ruler who will control the world will have control over all the precious things of the deep. Gold, silver, minerals. In James chapter 5, verse 1 through 6, it states that in the last days, certain men have heaped up riches to themselves, and they're the ones that will control everything, and they will rob the average person of his wages. Because this end time system will be a slave labor camp, a one planet slave labor camp. That's why they're reducing the good-paying jobs in America, sending them overseas where they work for a dollar an hour, dollar and a quarter an hour. And then all the jobs you get that used to pay 12 and 15 an hour, you go and work at McDonald's for 4 and 4.75 an hour. Everybody in the world's got to be equal. That's their goal. The whole world must be equal. In all the secret fraternities, they said that they must Adopt a program to make the whole human family, regardless of race 
or creed. No matter what religious organization you belong to, one happy family where they will redistribute the wealth of the world. Nobody will be poor. Nobody will be rich. Everybody will just subsist. But everybody will be equal. If everybody has nothing, we're all equally having nothing. And that's what they plan on. They're going to have everything and we have just enough to live on. Because if we have just enough to live on, then we can't rise up against them. Money is power. If you have no money, you have no power. If you have no food, your body is weak. You can't rise up against them. This is what they want. Brethren, also, it states in the Bible, Daniel 8, 23 to 25, that it will be the occult. Those who are involved in magic and witchcraft who will be in charge of the conspiracy. They'll understand dark sentences, tricky words, only known to the very elite. And that's why when the Democratic nominee, Bill Clinton, sent out his message, it was in occultic terminology. That's why when George Bush accepted the presidential nomination in 1988, he said it in occultic terminology. So those in the occult would know, I'm on the road toward world order. Also, those in charge said the whole world must be in chaos and crisis so that everybody on earth would finally lay down all desire of nationalism and cry out to the elite for world government. Don't we see that in Matthew chapter 24? Don't we see Christ said there would be wars, rumors of wars, there would be pestilence, disease epidemics? What do we have? AIDS, made in a laboratory in Fort Meade, Maryland, injected into the United Nations serum for smallpox and sent across Africa, and it's wiping out that continent. And it was sent into the undesirables in the cities of San Francisco with a type B typhoid. And so they've connected with AIDS now. And now there's mutant AIDS and there's other strands of AIDS. So they're wiping out the population. They're creating chaos. The Bible predicted it. It's happening. But now I want to tell you the good news. This is good. This is what you and I are doing here. Instead of out there, the good news is this conspiracy will fail. It will only last for three and a half years. And then it will ultimately fail because the great God of the universe is going to prove to these people once and for all he is personal. He's going to lay hands on Satan the devil and it won't be for healing. It'll be to put him in an abyss and set a seal over him for a thousand years so that he can never deceive anymore. He'll control the demonic angels and there will be peace all over the world. Look at Daniel chapter 2, verse 44. Daniel is a book of government. Daniel 2, verse 44. And in the days of these kings, that's the ten toes of this great image, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It'll not be left to the New Agers. But it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Daniel 11, verse 45. Here is the longest prophecy in the Bible in consecutive order. The 11th chapter of Daniel. When this individual moves into the Middle East, notice verse 45. He shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. And Thessalonians 2 said it will, he will set in the temple of God and claim to be God. Yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. Because Jesus, the Christ of Almighty God, is coming back to this earth. Revelation 19 will describe it to perfection. Revelation 19, 11 said, I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he does judge and make war. And then it describes who he is in verse 13, the word of God. John 1 verse 1 in, or chapter 1 verse 14 says the word of God is Jesus. Then verse 14, and the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses. You will be a part of that army. The good angels that followed God, two-thirds of God's angels, and then you. 
And notice it says, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And on up in the preceding part of the chapter, those who are at the marriage supper of the Lamb will have cleansed themselves from all sin. In verse 8, And to her, this is the church, was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. You and I, if we remain faithful and endure unto the end, we will be righteous. And we'll have our new glorified body. Nobody can assassinate you. Why will the kingdom of God last forever? They can't get rid of us. We'll bring them so much happiness, they'll just get sick of happiness. They'll have peace everywhere. No war. They'll have so much good food, grapes, cantaloupes, anything they want. And one scripture says back in Amos, I believe it is, in the latter part, that it'll take two men to carry uh, uh, some grapes. Two men. Can you imagine a grape the size of a watermelon? That's what it's going to be when Jesus restores everything the way it was in the Garden of Eden. And that's what you're going to be doing. Jesus Christ will restore all things. Acts 3, 18 to 21 says so. And you and I are going to be there as his assistants. Why is he calling us today to become kings and priests? And finally, the good news is in Philippians 2, verse 9 to 11. We should look forward to this with great anticipation because the world is seeking peace. It's seeking answers, but it's getting none. Wherefore, God also has highly exalted Him, Jesus Christ, our Savior, and given Him a name which is above every name, that at the knee of Jesus... Every knee shall bow of things in heaven, that's all the angelic host, and things in earth, that's even the Illuminati, and things under the earth, and that every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, that means master, controller, to the glory of God the Father. So yes, there is bad news ahead. But ultimately, we must have a vision that looks around the bad news to the ultimate goal. And if we keep our mind on the goal, nothing will restrain us from being in the kingdom of God and aiding Jesus Christ in straightening up this God-forsaken world.